The Be the Difference podcast is presented by Back to Back Ministries, a Christian nonprofit organization providing holistic care for orphan and vulnerable children and families around the world. To find out more about Back to Back or to follow on social media, head to backtoback.org. Welcome to Be the Different, stories of everyday people who are being the difference in the lives of others. I'm your host, Sammy Matthews, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Cox. Uh, let's do this, Sammy. I'm excited for today. I am too, Chris. Today, I got to talk to Megan Henderson. She lives in North Carolina. She's on staff with Venture Church. But what we talked about is the fact that Megan is a foster mom. She's a single foster mom. She's only 25 years old, and she has an incredible story to share. So let's hear Megan's story. Megan, welcome to the show. We are so excited to have you here. I'm really excited to get to talk to you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I know that in foster care, the status of how many kids you have in your house can change literally on any given day. So will you give us a status update? How many kids do you currently have in your home? Yeah, absolutely. I have four kids currently. So um, I have a five-year-old daughter, um, and she and my three-year-old son are biological siblings. Um, They have lived with me for two years. Um, And then my um, third is also a son, and he's about 17 months. And then about a month ago, we got a call that – he has a baby brother that needed a place. And so now I have a one month old. Um, so wow. <laughs> I have three, 17 months and one month. So four kids under five. Yeah. Yes. Five and under, yep. So you have been on this foster care journey for about two years now. Yeah. But if we like back up before you were like fluent in the language of foster care and adoption and orphan care, can you think of like a moment or a time when you first realized that people bringing other kids to live in their home was actually something people did? Like, when did you become aware of that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm the oldest of eight children. Um, I have four or I have three biological siblings and then I have four siblings that are adopted. Um, Three of them are internationally adopted. And then um, my sister was adopted as an adult. Um, And so Honestly, it, it, I don't, I can't pinpoint a specific time where that was um, not known for me. I'm sure that was a big part of what made you say yes to being a foster parent. What were the other reasons that you said yes, even as a single person, even as a young person? Yeah, I, I actually, um, whenever I was getting li- licensed for foster care, um, I, well, actually it started in January of 2019. Um, I was sitting at church on Sunday and um my dad's a pastor. And so um, pretty much anytime there's a licensing class in our county, um, we talk about it at church on Sunday and just like kind of offer like, hey, here's the information if you'd, if you'd be interested in that. Um, and I was just sitting there and um, I was like, you know what, like I, I, I might not be able to foster right now, but um, I know there's other ways to help. And I know respite is really um, necessary. And um, for those of you that don't know, like a lot of foster kids can't necessarily go to any home. They can't go to your family's home if they have to stay somewhere for a couple of days. And if you have to go out of town and they don't get approval to go with you, um, they have to stay typically in a licensed foster home. And so I um, was going to get licensed specifically to do that because I have weekends free and um, I have a great support system. And so um, I just kind of wanted to come alongside of foster families and support them in that role. Um, And so that's really what drove me um, to do foster care. Um, it ended up that my first respite placement is now my three-year-old son. So, um, so it didn't quite play out the way that I, um, I expected for my journey to play out. I I was expecting to be older and maybe be married before I actually took full-term or full-time placements. Um, but you know, when the Lord like laid the opportunity in my lap, um, to say yes to him, um, it, it was just very clear that that's what I needed to do. So you said that your church often talks about when there's licensing classes going on for foster care, talks about that from the stage. Why is that something that churches should be talking about? Yeah, I I, I talk about this frequently about how um, it's, it's just not talked about very frequently in churches. And um, if it is, it's just 
it's just on Orphan or Sand Sunday. It's it's not throughout the year, and it's just that that one designated Sunday. But you know, there's kids that are coming into foster care year round. They don't get to control when they're coming in. They they don't get to control when their whole world changes. And so, um, I think it's such a great um, thing to be a part of as believers because the Lord cares. Or the Lord cares about these kids, and He wants us to care about these kids. And 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 they're not just other people's kids. They're our kids. They're they're kids in our county. They're, they're kids that you see at the grocery store that you don't even really know are in foster care or um, about to be removed from their homes. It is a part of our calling as the church to um, stand in the gap for um, children and not just children, but their families, um, because the point of foster care, the purpose of foster care is re- to reunify family. And so um, just taking care of these kids so that these parents can um, get the help that they need um, so that their family can be restored and reunified. Um, I think that is such a beautiful picture of the gospel and, and God's redemption. And, you know, he's, he's not too, um, no one's too far gone from him. And so I think um, for me, I just think that it's so important that the church stands in the gap. Mm. What role does community or what kind of support system do you have to do this really hard thing yeah. of foster care? I have great community. Um, like I've talked about, my church um, has definitely rallied around me and my kids. Um, my family lives really close by, and, and my family is, I mean, they're phenomenal. They, I'm the oldest of eight, so they've got lots of aunts and uncles that are always mm-hmm. ready to um, babysit or um, help me out, however. But um, truly, truly community plays a huge role. Um, like, I could never do this alone. I'm a single I'm a single parent, but but I don't do this by myself, you know. Did you have anyone when you were first um, signing up tell you that this wasn't a good idea? Yes. <laughs> yes, I've had plenty of people along the way um, kind of dis- discourage uh, me. Um, I think um, because I am a single parent, um, kids, they, they want kids to have moms and dads. And, and I completely agree with that and understand that. Um, I think that there's also a need that has to be filled. And, and sometimes there's kids that, um, because of things that have happened to them in the past, would thrive um, in a only uh, mom home. Um, mm. I know, um, you know, foster care and adoption is not, it, it was not God's original design. You know, his, it wasn't a part of his perfect plan. And so um, ideally, I really believe that kids should be able to stay with the families that they um, were born to um, with a mom and a dad and siblings. And, you know, God created that family. Um, and unfortunately the way, um, the way the world is um, circumstances and situations happen. And, and um, so I've had a lot of discouragement um, for sure. Yeah. So you have those voices coming at you yeah. and you have the voices of your community that are supporting you. Yeah. And you have just what is hard about being a parent to four kids under four, Five. Yeah. How in the midst of all of that do you still find joy in everyday life and take care of yourself? Caring for myself looks often like just having my time at night where I sit and I literally do my quiet time. I would do it in the mornings, but you know, I'm just not I'm just not that good, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I think you gotta know what works for you. Oh, for I don't sure. think there's a good for or a bad. Sure, for sure. So I have my time at night and it's just like uninterrupted. The kids are all sleeping and this is like my uninterrupted time with the Lord. And um, I have, it's hard for me to stay committed to that, I think, but um, I have to prioritize it just like I have to prioritize washing bottles and washing dishes and, you know, um, because if that doesn't get done, then it affects everything else. How has your prayer life changed since you've become a parent? (laughs) It's changed a lot. Um, I think, um, especially being a foster parent, I have no control um, over pretty much the entirety of my family. Um, You know, maybe some foster families do because they're married and they have the consistency of their marriage and they have the consistency of biological children. Um, But I have zero control over any of my children or or any other cases or or what's going to happen tomorrow, you know. and so I think I used to just like ask God for a lot of things and just like, Hey God, like I'd really love for this to happen or, but now it's more of a, Hey, I am surrendering these kids to you. I have, I can't do anything. And so, um, 
it's a lot more of a surrender <laughs> than um, maybe my prayers were before. And just like, okay, God, I know you're in control. And asking for discernment, you know, um, I like I don't get to make decisions, but I can't advocate. And so um, it's kind of a complicated place to be in the world of foster care, advocating for kids um, while they live with you, while you pray that they are reunified with their first families. Um, but just a lot of asking for discernment and a lot of um, just trusting and leaning into the Lord more than maybe I did before. Mm -hmm. I like the word surrender. Oh, just for sure. <laughs> having to release, like yeah. you said, control. Yeah. That's, that's not easy. That no, is a really hard all. thing to do. <laughs> yes, it definitely is. So you had your first placement a little over two years ago now, right around two years. Yes. Yeah. Can you put yourself back in that very first night when your – it was your son who was your first placement, right? right? Yes, yes. So the first night your son is in your home with you, what were you thinking, feeling, experiencing? I just remember, like, there was definitely some moments of panic, like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I've never been responsible for a child, like, full time. <laughs> you know, I, uh, it was my first time parenting, my first time doing it, and I'm like, what did I just do? <laughs> Thanks for admitting that you felt panic. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that stood out to me. I had an experience where I was a caregiver to seven kids in a residential facility for a period of time. And on that first night, I remember panicking oh, yeah. and saying, who thought I was capable of this? <laughs> right. Yeah, like who gave me the ability to watch this one-year-old? Who who, who yeah. just did this? What? <laughs> Yes. Thank you for validating that because I remember thinking, I now have to keep them alive. Oh, yep. Like, this is my yep. my job. Yep. No one else's job except for yours. And it's terrifying <laughs> for sure. For sure. Hmm. Kind of on that same theme, as you think about your journey so far, is there something you would have done differently? Yeah. I think, um, especially when I first started, um, a lot of people had questions. Um, you know, not about me, about my kids. And so um, at the beginning, I was very naive to um, everything, just the system, my kids, you know, I, just their stories. And um, so I didn't do a good job of protecting their stories. Um, and so I think my biggest thing is um, probably in the past year is when I've really realized um, how important it is to protect their stories. and. Um, at the beginning, I did a very terrible job of doing that. So if I were to go back, I definitely would. You know, I think I had the mindset of um, these kids are part of my life and therefore their story is my story. And that's just not not true. Um, yes, I am a part of their story, but I do not have the authority to share their story with other people. It's theirs and theirs alone to share um, if they choose to one day. And um, so if I were to go back, it definitely would be um, – protect my kids and their stories and um, where they come from, because um, that's not mine to share. What do you, what is at risk if we, as people who are involved in the lives of kids from vulnerable places, don't protect their stories? I know that I'll never understand what my kids are going through and um, what they've experienced up to this point in their life um, and what they'll experience in the future, um, being an adoptee or being a former foster youth. Um, so, Voices of other former foster youth and adoptees are really important to me. And so um, looking to them um, for advice has been really eye-opening. Um, I think a lot of um, them are bitter because their parents have shared um, their stories. And a lot of them um, are very frustrated because it's it's no longer theirs. It's tainted and it's um, it's been... Um, changed somewhat, and it's been only shared through the eyes of their, I mean, of their adoptive parents, you know. And so I think we just um, risk the trust of our kids uh, when we when we freely share. Um, and I just never want to do anything um, to hinder my kids from um, wanting to share things with me in the future. Um, I don't want um, me sharing their stories, me sharing um, who they are to other people to hinder that from happening in the future. I think that's really empowering them because Absolutely. a lot of kids who come into foster care have don't have a lot of power or control. Right. And 
it's something you're giving back to them. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a gift yeah. that you're giving them. Yeah. I think you said this earlier a little bit, but the children who are in your life have biological family and biological parents, and they don't come just like as little solo people. They are part of another family. How has your view of biological family of kids in foster care changed over the years? Yeah. Um, it's, it's very much goes along with how I was very um, open about sharing my kids' stories at the very beginning, and now I'm a lot more protective. Um, and I think a big reason is because I've gotten to know their biological families. And so, um, you know, when you sit with a biological family, you realize these are just people just like me and you, you know, they're, um, they're not these monsters that sometimes, um, people make them out to be. Um, I know they've made bad choices. Um, I know, um, they find themselves in really hard circumstances, but they're just people. And, um, you know, the Lord cares about them just as much as he cares about me and I'm no better than them. You know, um, I always say, um, like, I'm only a few bad choices or a few challenging life circumstances away from being in their same shoes. And so um, I think that helps me keep my perspective of like, okay, Megan, like you're not better than them. You know, sometimes it's really easy um, to feel like you are because you're the foster parent and, and um, this child was removed from this home and came to you. And so you just feel better, but um, that's just not true. And um, you know, the Lord can redeem anyone. No one's too far gone. And, um, so my heart, honestly, these days is so for biological parents. I, I want them to succeed. I want them to um, get healthy so their kids can um, be reunified. I, I desire that, you know, um, in a way that I didn't maybe towards the beginning um, of my time being a foster parent. So the biological parents of your kids are involved in your life and in the lives of your kids. Yes, they are. What kind of emotions does that stir up for you when yeah. you're like both in the same room? I think prior to even um, getting together, um, I think my emotions were very much like, um, how is this going to play out? You know, like how um, very much worry and fear, I think. And honestly, I think a little bit of jealousy of like, I've been mom, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't want someone else to overtake that role. But, you know, I don't think the titles define who you are to someone. And, um, you know, I think caring for kids, loving their biological parents and allowing your kids to see them loving your biological parent, their biological parents, um, has been one of the biggest blessings to me and my kids. Um, it's actually, I mean, it's done wonders for my children to be able to see all of us together. I think a really common fear that I hear often when people are talking about being a foster parent or foster care is this fear that what if they come to live with me and I get really attached and we get really close and I love them and then they leave. That would be heartbreaking or that would be hard. How do you rationalize that? How do you prepare your heart for that? Yeah. What's been your experience? My biggest um advice to those people is just jump in because um, even though you're fearful of that, that probably means that you'd be really good at this. Um, you, mm. you, people are afraid of getting too attached. And that's the purpose of foster care is that these kids have a healthy adult to attach to. You know, we're adults. We have um, ways to handle our emotions and whatever. These are kids. They're they're young. They, they need someone in their life to support them. We can handle it when a kid leaves. We can... Um, we can figure it out. We can go to therapy. We can get what we need, you know. Um, what are these kids going to do if nobody steps up for them? When you think about taking it day by day, if there was a child who came into your home and was only there one day, what would you hope they experience and feel while under your roof? My biggest hope is that they would um, love Jesus and and know that, um, that we love Jesus and that um, Jesus loves them. And that's the biggest um, thing I think, um, but that we're a family and um, families don't give up on each other. So even if they leave our home, like we have a little tree in our house, it's not like a real tree, but like a wall hanging. And every kid has their name written on the tree, no matter if they've come for a day or if they've stayed for two years, 
Their name's on the tree. So they're a part of our family. And um, yes, we don't get to see them every day. Yes, we may never know what happens to them after they leave. Um, but they were still a part of a family for that day. I love that visual of the tree. Oh, it's my favorite thing in my house, I think. <laughs> it's it's right next to my door, like my um, my door to go in and out of the house. And um, it's probably one of my favorite things in my house. Um, it's definitely a treasure because... Um, I mean, there's some kids that have only been here for like 10 hours, you know, but they're still on that tree. And, and, they're, and they're on the and, tree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. I I love that. So if you were sitting down for coffee and sitting across the table from someone who was saying, I think I might go to this licensing class to be a foster parent, but I don't know. I'm pretty scared. I'm nervous. I don't know that I want to do this. Yeah. What would you say to them? do it. I think, um, I think people are very fearful of a lot of things, but, but, you know, unless you jump in, you're just never going to know. And so if you are considering it, I absolutely would urge you to, to go to that information meeting or to start that licensing class. You know, you might get halfway through and realize, you know what, I can't do this. And and that's okay. I'm, I don't think that being a foster parent is for every person. It's hard and it's challenging. And, um, It doesn't work for every life circumstance. And so um, you might get through halfway through that class and realize, okay, this, this isn't what I need to do. But, um, you know, I think that um, if you feel like the Lord's calling you to do that, then you need to to be faithful and um, trust that he um, knows what he's doing. I've heard one big thing is like, how will this affect my biological um, children? And I feel like I can speak into that because I am um, a biological child of, um, parents who have adopted, they might not have fostered, but, um, I feel like, um, I can speak into that too, of just like, you know, um, my life is forever changed because of my parents saying yes to my siblings and my life looks the way it does now because of that. Yes. That they said. And for people who like are, are pretty clear that they aren't called to be a foster parent themselves, how can they still be involved? How can they support foster families? Like, what do you need people to do? Yeah. I think just finding a foster family that is in your community and um, being consistent with that foster family and just, you know, reaching out and saying like, um, I'll be honest, I don't do well when people are like, hey, can I bring you food? Or like, hey, and I'll just be like, no, we're okay. But maybe just like saying like, hey, I'm going to bring you dinner on Thursday night. Will you guys be home? You know, or, hey, I'm going to come mow your grass. Or, um, hey, I'm going to do this. You know, um, I just want your permission to do this. Um, rather than like, hey, what do you need? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah um, totally. A lot of foster parents, I think, are more, um, I think in general, um, a lot of us are not going to just like ask for help. We, we, <laughs> we um, I tend to struggle with that a lot is asking for help. But um you know, just, just being really intentional, maybe with like finding one foster family and just pouring into them and being consistent with them, because there's a lot of inconsistency in my life, you know, and in the lives of foster parents because of um, the system and how it works and how it operates. Um, And so having consistency of someone supporting you is really important. And even just prayer, (laughs) you know, just um, someone that says like, Hey, you don't have to share all the details, but how can I pray for you? Um, I don't need to know what's going on with your kids and their cases, but how can I pray for you? How are you um, doing right now, honestly, and and being able to listen? And um, I do believe that everybody is called to do something. And so um, I think those are easy-ish ways to be able to be involved without directly being a foster parent. Well, Megan, as we wrap up, the last thing that I want to say is thank you. Thank you first for sharing your story and being really vulnerable with us about how it hasn't always been easy and there have been moments of panic and that have been hard. But I also want to say thank you on behalf of every name hanging on that tree in your house, Mm -hmm. on behalf of every child that has spent anywhere from 10 hours to 10 days to two years in your home, for the care and support and love that you gave them. Thank you on behalf of their biological families that you will never meet and never know. Thank you for standing in the gap and caring for their kids when they couldn't for whatever reason. Thank you for saying yes and for being an example to people who are up close in your life and people far away who are watching you. 
Thank you for just being an example of what can happen when we say yes. There is a tree on a wall with some really amazing and beautiful names. And I ended that podcast, Sammy, thinking about a seven-year-old little boy. I don't know why I went there, but Mm -hmm. went there of like staring up at this tree that's probably bigger than him Mm. and reading names on it and finding hope. And belonging. And belonging. Yeah, Yeah. I, I just... I, I could just stay in that visualization for a while because yeah. I think that was a very powerful thing that Megan created in her home mm-hmm. that is telling a greater story. And I love that it's a tree. Yeah, well, I loved that even if the kid is there 10 hours, yeah. they have a place to belong for those 10 hours. And that was really powerful to me because foster care like she said like there's so much inconsistency there's so much transience like coming and going but that place on that tree is there forever yeah it's this it's this felt safety that it creates as well that you can be here 10 hours and be safe Mm, you can be here the rest of your life and be safe and I love that element of it I also loved her vantage point on why you might say yes. One thing that really stood out to me in the conversation was that Megan took some things that may be fear-based reasons that we wouldn't get involved, and she flipped them into optimistic opportunities to say this might be why you should like your desire for attachment of saying, I know I get too attached. Sometimes we would say, don't go. Mm-hmm. And she would say, no, that's the way God wired you. Kids are looking for healthy attachment. Yeah. Just be okay with things like attachment being an opportunity for you. Yeah, she said that's what might make you the perfect person for foster care. Yes, yeah. kids need that relationship and that connection. And that's what she's done in such a self-sacrificial way, in a surrendered way. Um, she kept coming back to this concept of like she doesn't have control. She right. doesn't have control of anything. And the truth is none of us really have control of anything. Yeah. But I was thinking about the way like her life kind of got interrupted. Mm-hmm. Like she had one path and it was interrupted. And as each kid arrived, it's kind of like a, a new interruption. And I heard this quote the other day from C.S. Lewis that said, who you are when interrupted is the truest version of yourself. So I was thinking like, okay, mm-hmm. small daily interruptions. What does that mean about me? But then like in big life moments where God wants to interrupt my life, who am I and how do I respond? Yeah. And in the world you and I live in, we we talk a lot about our windows of tolerance in those moments and those interruptions too. And I think who I am when interrupted is directly correlated to what my window of tolerance is during that time. Yeah. Like how much you can handle in that moment. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it it doesn't go shame based of if, if when interrupted... I have negative responses. It's actually a great internal conversation for us to have of going, wait a minute, what's my window of tolerance right now? And I think Megan alluded to that of of saying, we can say yes to children entering into our homes because we're grown ups. She she alluded to that. She's like, we're grown ups. We can handle it. We can handle it. We can have conversations. And I even love how she framed like, we can get therapy. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, she affirmed that as a resource that we can use when our windows of tolerance feel low or our fear feels high, that these are opportunities for us to take to say yes. Yeah, I guess for me, it's making me think like, what do I need so that I live in a way and in a state that I can be interrupted? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the possibility of an interruption leading to the opportunity to redefine family. And I Mm -hmm. felt like that was a thread throughout the entire conversation from the way her parents redefined family for her as a child, from the way her siblings see family, even now as they support one another and and have defined family differently just amongst them, and how she as a single woman in her 20s has redefined Mm -hmm. a cultural approach to family in such a powerful and positive way. I just love the redefining family that just like was woven throughout this conversation. Yeah, and includes the biological family yes. of the kids that she's brought into her home. It's it's an expansion of what we would traditionally say is family. And so I also loved that she said everybody has a part to play 
in foster care. Like yes. these are our kids yeah. in our counties and it's kids and their families. So I'm walking away thinking, what's what's my part to play? Right. Me too. I um, had a, I, you can tell I'm a visual learner sometimes that when she said, you know, don't ask if I need food, just show up with food or um, just offer to mow my lawn. I started thinking about like lawn services just showing up at foster parents' homes. And in 20 minutes, a lawn service can zip through a yard and you just walk outside and you're like, oh, that's one less thing I have to do so that I can deepen investment in the children that are living here. I just love those ideas and those, those dreams. And that's what I would encourage us as a community, as an audience, just dream a little bit about what role you could play in the redefining of family as we deepen attachment, in saying yes to the interruption, mm-hmm. and in being able to create some space where you play a part that could be as simple as just showing up with a meal or a lawnmower. Yeah. I think those are some great opportunities that we can consider as a community. And as always, we're just grateful for you to be here. Sammy, amazing interview. Really grateful for the way that you guys had conversation and even how you gave us a little bit of your own story in that. We can't wait to talk to you on the next episode. We will, uh, again, be hosted here from our friends at Cohatch. We're grateful for them. And check the show notes for any connections around foster care, some trauma competency resources, and ways to get involved in this movement.